you are in the, the session invest in trash collection to sustain recycling. Uh, I will be presenting as well as Vita Quinn from SCS engineers. So before we talk about how to invest in trash collection to sustain recycling, I, I thought it would be worthwhile to kind of look at sort of how we got here. And every time I write these songs, I, I think of that song by the Talking Heads, but it kind of has been a strange trip we've been on for the last 30 years. Um, anyone, does anyone know what this is? This, this garbage picture? barge. Garbage, garbage barge, right. Um, 30 years ago, uh, the garbage barge was floating all throughout the United States. It originated in New York City, uh, spent some time on some international waters. Nobody wanted this garbage, and for six months it floated around. Uh, it ended up back in New York City. But what the garbage barge did actually was, it was a catalyst. It was a wake-up call to all of us that we did not have unlimited landfill capacity. We really weren't doing much with recycling. Um, we only had about a thousand curbside recycling programs at that time. Most were in California, Oregon, a little bit in Colorado. Uh, now we have over 4,300. Uh, 49 states ban at least one material from landfill disposal. Does anyone know the state that has absolutely no landfill bans? I'm going to say it's a Western state. Idaho? Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's a state that they use the expression, show me. Missouri. Missouri has uh, absolutely no landfill bans. They're, they're a stubborn state in many respects. Um, and then 35% of U.S. waste is recycled or composted. Also in Ohio, um, you know, we were one of the first states to come up with a solid waste management planning law. It was adopted in 1988. It created 52 solid waste management districts. And today, every single resident in Ohio has access to some form of recycling, whether it be curbside or drop-off. Next question, what is this a picture of? Some, some stuff coming over to our from China. It, where our recyclables are back on a boat and in a little bit neater package, and you were correct, I think that was Kathleen, yes. um, that it's sending our recyclables to China. So we've made progress in 30 years, but we're still spending a lot of time on boats. Um, and China, it, you know, it was the market. 40% of all of our recyclables went to China. Um, Ireland, the EU, Australia, everybody was dependent on China. China was paying really good prices for our materials. Um, but they, you know, said in 2018, hey, we, we don't want your trash anymore. And as we all know, it turned everything upside down. And why was everything going to China? There was an expanding manufacturing industry, lax environmental regulations, cheap labor, and backhauling. You know, they were shipping all their goods to us, and instead of sending a ship empty back to China, uh, they were willing to take our recyclables and bring them back. Again, we all know the Chinese sword impacts. MERS has increased processing fees significantly. I think, um, is Jessica on the call? I thought I saw her signed up. Um, are you there, Jessica? I don't think so. So, you know, the city of Cleveland, they only got one proposal for their curbside recycling. And I think it was going to cost them about $200 a ton to have their recycling program continued. And I think maybe GT is working with them on that. So uh, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong on that. Uh, recycling <laughs> being stockpiled, sent to waste energy plants, and municipalities are reevaluating the viability of curbside recycling. Um, last count, there are over 190 cities in the U.S. that have stopped doing curbside recycling since 2018. But it also really made us think of, is sending our recyclables to China truly a circular economy? I mean, I personally and anyone else jump in if they have thoughts on this, but, you know, I always struggled with how environmentally valuable it was to use a separate truck to collect our recyclables, transport them via long haul to some port in the U.S., put it on a boat over to China, have them created into some kind of product in a country that has very, very uh, questionable environmental standards from water emissions, air emissions. 
So I think it really made us step back and say, you know, if we're going to do a circular economy, can we do it at home and send everything abroad? So it did create a national dialogue on recycling of, you know, is it really the best thing to put as much stuff into a cart or is it you're better off telling your residents to only put clean recyclables in the cart? It also helped us understand that recycling is not free and that again, that collecting material is not recycling. It encouraged domestic markets for recyclables and fostered innovation. There's a new plant coming online in Indiana called Brightmark that is going to take three through seven recyclables and put them into fuel. The only way that they can do that is partnering with the state of Indiana. They need just about every single three through seven to make their system economically viable. So we were, like I said, 2018 was horrible. 2019, everything was getting a little bit better. We had some paper mills come online. The prices were getting a little bit better. And then COVID-19 COVID and 2020, it just smacked us in the face yet again. I mean, recycling cannot get a break over the last couple of years. You know, one of the biggest, most profitable parts of uh, recycling is the commercial because it is a clean waste stream, a lot of carb cardboard, which, you know, at its worst only got zero dollars a ton but at least it wasn't in negative numbers um, where the cities were having to pay to get rid of the commercial. Um, now there's less commercial. Everybody's working at home. We're seeing higher contamination yet again. I just did a, a waste sort in Kirkwood, Missouri and things like frozen food boxes took a huge spike. Um, the other thing I found interesting in Kirkwood is that when I did the sort, and Kirkwood is a bedroom community to St. Louis, pretty affluent. And when I did the sort in the fall, um, a lot of high-end wine bottles, uh, not a lot of beer cans. When I did the sort a couple weeks ago, uh, the high-end, now I saw a lot of barefoot <laughs> wine bottles. I saw a lot of wine boxes in the corrugated. Uh, the corrugated is through the roof. I mean, corrugated was maybe number four to six on the most prominent recyclable. It was number one in the sort this time. Um, but again, I saw contaminants that I did not see before. Uh, driver shortages, you know, COVID has caused people to get sick. COVID has caused some drivers to stay home. Cities are eliminating things like bulky waste collection. So all of that is hurting recycling because they're pulling recycling crews just to pick up the garbage and for cities that were actually looking and looking in the lid to see what if it was recyclable or trash and tagging a cart, that's just not happening anymore. And then the finally is, you know, cities are losing money left and right. My city where I'm from, Cincinnati, um, the majority of our tax base is earnings revenues. And, and that was based on people that didn't live in the city and were coming into the city to work. People are working at home. They're not coming in the city. There's less uh, employment in the city right now. Um, you know, people aren't going to restaurants, so they're cutting staff. Cities are hurting, hurting, hurting. I am a member of the National Committee for the American Public Works Association, and every single co conference call that we have, these are the issues that are being brought up, and they are saying, I don't know if I can continue to recycle. So coming back to where, where we are right now. Um, Karen? Yes. Looks like somebody is actually some, putting something in the chat. Sorry, I missed it. Kathleen wants to know when the plant is coming online. Uh, they're in construction right now, and it's looking like 21-22, like end of okay, this thank year, you. 2022. So yeah, it's permitted. It's And I've seen a lot of these kind of technologies never see the light of day. Uh, this one seems to have some legs. So where I think this is really an opportunity in Ohio, uh, I think most of you know I ran a solid waste management district, Hamilton County. I've worked with a lot of the districts and there's never been a lot of communication between the public works departments and cities in solid waste districts. Even though both entities are responsible for solid waste, they had very different roles that they were playing. Um, the districts were more long-term planning, landfill diversion, program development, grants, Public Works is, you know, O&M of getting those trucks out there, picking up the materials, uh, having to go into debt on facilities, uh, having to purchase equipment, you know, so there were two different roles. And like I said, not, not a lot of conversation. I know when I was at Hamilton County, 
I don't think I ever even rode on a garbage truck. I don't even know if I ever spoke with the public works director of the city of Cincinnati. Because of everything that's going on, there has to be synergy between the districts and public works because, you know, quite honestly, if the city stopped recycling, the districts aren't going to achieve their goals. And I know that Ohio EPA is not going to you know, put anybody in jail over it, but there's been a lot of work over the last 30 years to create these recycling systems, to get the programs. And, you know, quite honestly, we have spent decades telling children how important it is to recycle. And if we can't keep it going now, um, you know, th those kids aren't going to listen to us again. So it, it is just essential to figure this out together. So, and again, I know this is a different dynamic for districts and cities on working together, but I think districts are in a role right now that they have to help cities assure financial security. And that is understanding the cost of collecting trash. Uh, you know, I, again, I work in a lot of cities all over the country. I've worked in some Ohio cities. And, you know, they, they really don't have cost of service studies. of What is this actually costing us? What costs stay even if the recycling program goes away? Um, identifying ways to reduce costs, you know, whether it's through changing service delivery, uh, changing the materials that are collected. Going back to that Kirkwood sort, so they take recyclables three through seven, both in the fall sort and in the September sort that I just completed. Recycling three through sevens are less than 2% of what's showing up in the, their green carts. For Republic to take their three through sevens, it is increasing their processing fee by $40 a ton. So again, it's looking at, you know, what, what, where's the best, where's their biggest bang for the buck? Um, assuring there's enough revenue to collect their trash and developing a capital improvement plan. You know, the other thing I'm seeing right now is cities are uh, deferring purchasing trucks because they're like, I just can't afford to buy these trucks. They don't want to raise rates because everybody's struggling. But what this is doing to them three years down the road is that they're going to have to buy not one truck, but maybe they're going to have to buy five trucks. And then to do that, they're going into debt and they go into debt and then they have less money for recycling. It, it, it's just a nasty spiral. So what is financial security? Um, Vita, why don't you take over from here since you know about the money? explain when we talk about financial security or financial sustainability um, we look at it a little bit differently than I think you would normally have those conversations with finance so it's not about this budget year and it's not about coming up with numbers it's about looking at a long-term plan to make sure that you have enough money in reserves to be able to not only continue to operate without disruption but to be able to to recover when you have um, emergencies or fluctuations in the fiscal year or in the economy like we're seeing now. So some of the things that we see that commonly affect people's financial outcomes or just you know, in the short term or even the medium term um, are population changes. So that any sort of change in the, the growth of your city as well as in the growth in your service area. So if you've annexed properties into your service area or into the city itself and your our county and you're now serving additional homes, um, changes in contracts or franchise agreements. When those agreements um, come up for renegotiation, if there's or if they're tied to certain indices, you can see that those uh, one year versus the next may change rather dramatically. We also see significant changes in tonnage and diversion over time, as well as depending on the state and the regulations. Um, costs that would affect your service levels, things like fuel and labor. So what we're really looking for in a financial plan then is balancing the need for revenues from your rates, fees, other service charges, and to maintain adequate reserve and fund balances with the need to continue operating, um, paying for capital, and paying for existing and possibly new debt service that you might have. So we're going to talk a little bit about a city called Odessa, Texas, which um, I had the pleasure to visit last fall. Odessa, Texas is in West Texas, uh, completely dependent on oil. When we first engaged with them, they uh, were uh, in a major, major growth period. I mean, the oil industry since 2016 
uh, because regulations have been changed, uh, is the growth is significant. Um, Odessa was facing a problem though because uh, they had to have a competition or they were competing with the oil industry for truck drivers and for maintenance workers. And as you might imagine, the, the oil industry pays a whole lot more than the city uh, for those, those types of jobs. So their, their baseline it was a city with twice a week trash collection. Uh, the majority of their customers are served uh, by dumpsters and alleys. And I know like the city of Columbus has a lot of alleys in it. Uh, no curbside recycling. Uh, the drop-off sites, they were taking different materials. And when I would ask them, why do some take paper and one take paper and plastics, some just take plastics? It was sort of the answer, we don't really know. It just kind of evolved that way. Um, their recycling processor was losing money. They were, the processor was not charging a processing fee. Uh, the contract that they entered into five years prior, Marcus recyclables were good. Processor saying, if, if, if things, if you don't pay me something, um, I'm going to be out of business. At the same time, residents really, really, really wanted more recycling. Um, they, a lot of them wanted curbside recycling. So it, we had a situation that what the residents wanted and what the city could afford uh, were two different things. And this was during the baseline. So we did a little bit of research to help prepare the city. And in West Texas, uh, the average recycling cost per ton was $70 a ton. As I said before, they, they couldn't compete for drivers, for mechanics. The city couldn't afford to pay more. Um, and because they didn't have enough mechanics, the trucks were breaking down. And then they had more overtime because the trucks were not breaking down. Customers were not getting service. Customers were not happy. Um, so it just, again, it, it, the, the city was facing a lot of challenges. Uh, they didn't have enough, as Vita says, capital reserves. And that's just enough money to buy trucks or if you have to repair a building. Um, they didn't have enough fleet because they didn't have capital reserves. Uh, as I said before, they had alley collection with dumpsters. It was supposed to be a ratio of uh, one dumpster to four customers. Uh, they really had never had a chance to step back and see if that was the ratio just by driving through the city. Uh, anecdotally, we could tell that that was not the ratio. Um, and then in some areas, they had maybe seven customers to a dumpster and that dumpster was overflowing and causing open dumping. And in the alleys, when you have open dumping, it, it's just a kind of welcome sign to come here and dump some more. And as I said before, they, they didn't have capital reserves. They'd never had a chance to step back. They were so busy, and this is not uncommon, they were so busy just getting the garbage collected, they never really had a chance to step back and say, okay, wh where's the game plan? Where are we going with all of this? So, you know, they were really in a quandary. They, you know, do they reduce service? No elected official likes to reduce service and they were afraid that, you know, people would complain and scream. They were seriously thinking about eliminating recycling. And even though, like I said, when we did public opinion surveys, people wanted more, they were like, we, we, we just don't think we're gonna be able to afford it. Uh, you know, another option was to raise their customer rates. Um, to get enough money to keep recycling and to build up capital reserves and have money to buy trucks and pay mechanics the right price or salary and pay drivers the right salary. They were looking at some pretty significant steep customer rates, which kind of leans to, you know, they were kind of at the point where maybe we should just privatize. Maybe let's just get out of the business. You know, it, it's just causing us headaches. Um, but at the same time, when we did some benchmarking, you know, the, the private, Sollers, uh, you know, we're charging cities more, a lot more than what Odessa was going to pay. So we're like, you know, is there a way to salvage this? And, and, you know, obviously my passion is, was there a way to keep recycling going? So we did a number of strategies and, you know, analyses, all the stuff, you know, so as consultants do. And, you know, we really focused in on, you know, re reducing the alley collection. You know, we felt that in the alleys, you know, people really did not know how many times that their dumpsters were getting serviced. They didn't know which days it was getting serviced. It's not like when you have your garbage cart and you have that personal relationship with it. So we, we did a lot of mapping on, you know, what routes had capacity to go to once a week and not have overflow of the garbage containers um, versus routes that they would have to keep it twice a week to prevent dumping. We also looked at things like standardizing and right-sizing their community drop-off sites. 
Um, for the community that, that was that size, they probably had too many. It was really, really confusing to residents of, you know, some taking only plastics, some taking paper, and the thing is all these drop-off sites all fed into the same processing facility. So there was absolutely no reason to have different, different sites. Um, we also looked at, you know, the reducing the 96 gallon cart collection frequency in year two. Uh, we thought if we could get some wins in year one, maybe we could get political support to reduce that in year two and adjusting the ratio of three cubic yard carts in the alleys to the customers. And those are kind of our main points. I guess the other was facilitating curbside recycling. Uh, the city could never afford to just pay for curbside recycling. And you know we were estimating eight to $10 a month to have that service collection and processing. So what we recommended to them was a subscription program. That, you know, if the residents wanted to have recycling, they could su subscribe directly with the processor who would expand their program to include collection. We also thought that would help get a cleaner recycling waste stream if the processor was out there actually picking up the recyclables. I know we've thrown a lot of information and, you know, what we have found with elected officials that if we can show them how all this stuff works, um, the chances of them actually uh, making a decision is easier. So. Yeah, so um, it's a lot to look at, so I'll kind of explain what you're seeing here. This is our financial model that we use to do projections over a 10 year period. And so this was their baseline financial health. This graph here on the upper right is the fund balance that they had relative to their minimum target, which is that red line. So as it was, they needed sort of inflationary type rate increases throughout the projection period. And they would dip below, below their fund balance due to just capital investment and other things in one year. But overall, they, you know, they had a relatively healthy fund that way. What they lacked, like Karen mentioned, was the ability to fund capital. So what this model does is you know, you see two sets of bars here. So the yellow bars will remain the same. We'll always be looking at that baseline. And as we test different alternatives for them, these green bars will move. So we'll be able to look at the, the different fund balances, different uh, potential rate plans, different um, impacts on the average residential customer, which is in this graph here on the upper left. And we can look at the amount of capital that they're funding. So Karen, why don't you walk yeah, us through so the scenarios? So as I said, we put together 16 scenarios and, and options. So if you can go to that options tab, Vita. You wanna look at the options first? Yes. So, um, so what we did is for every single option, we, we monetized it as far as what it would cost to implement the option. For example, um, you know, standardizing the drop-off recycling containers. You know, we had a budget in there for education. Then we looked at, okay, if you increase recycling by this X amount, how much money would you save in the landfill fees? For the collection options, we build in the cost of, uh, you know, if you were to buy routing software, what would that cost you? And how long would it take you to enter the data? So a lot of the things with regards to collection, they may be spending money in year one and two, but by year three, they start saving money. So we went in and did that for every single option. So they, the city knew what it would cost, what they could save, what their net savings or net costs would be, and what their potential landfill diversion would be. So uh, Vita, go over to your magical spreadsheet. So if you go to the options tab, oh, you're there, thank you. So the first thing we did, like I said, you know, is if the bids came back better, and if there was competition, if they stayed at zero, and they increased recycling by the percent we, we forecast it, which op, that would be option three. Turn that into a yes, please. Option uh, do, 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 9, 10, 11, and 12. So if they implemented all of the recycling options and they increased landfill diversion. Oh, the other thing I never said, they were at 3% landfill diversion. So we had a lot of potential in the city. So if that were to occur, uh, Vita, what happens with that? So when you look at the green bars again, you can see that they now have more fund balance, in fact, far in excess of their minimum reserve targets. If, if the recycling markets would stay good. Yes. But, you know, 
you know, you plan for the, you hope for the best, plan for the worst. So we went ahead and said, okay, if those, those bids come in at $70 a ton, what, what is that going to do to you? And as you can see, it got, I mean, they, they have no capital reserves. They are out of money by 2026. And, you know, they are going into major debt to, through 27 through 29. So obviously these are things that, you know, city managers look at and, you know, a city manager, his first thing is going to be cut recycling. And we knew that that could be a potential. So then we started saying, okay, we know it's, you know, your customers aren't going to like less collection at the curb and less collection in the alleys, but we got to look at saving you money. And so go back over, please Vita to the, um, the options tab. So then we said, okay, um, option 4A, reduce residential alley collection to once a week instead of twice a week. Reduce the 96 gallon cart collection and adjust the ratio of dumpsters to customers. And we truly did feel that option um, 4A and 5 would not receive much political pushback as long as there was not open dumping occurring of it. And that's why we did all that mapping up front. Uh, the 96 gallon cart customers tended to be the more affluent, um, but they were also the ones that really wanted recycling. So we thought we could really position this of, you know, if you want recycling, you're going to have to have your refuse collection once a week and you have the opportunity to subscribe for curbside recycling under our, our plan. So if you go back to the previous page. So, so now we have um, more fun balances again which is a good scenario for the city because they didn't really want to have to implement 3% um, rate increases if they could avoid it. So now we can see if they did maybe two and a half percent. Obviously that is music to a city manager's ears that, you know, we're not, we're not giving up recycling. Um, we can make the case that uh, you know, reducing collection will save recycling, but it will also reduce the amount of how much the garbage bill needs to increase over the next 10 years. Right. And two and a half was even possibly more than they needed. Um, you could do two or even slightly less than that, but you're getting to where now you have sort of low reserves in a few years. You're falling significantly below your target fund balances. So what might be smarter to do is maybe in 2025 start an inflationary type adjustment but in the near term have go back up to that two and a half percent for a few years now you're a lot closer to your target and so that may be a little bit more palatable because they're pretty close to their reserve targets in most years and you've lowered that need for rate adjustments so politically that's probably a much more feasible situation in fact in the out years you probably could even lower that need or go a couple of years without the need for rate increases. And we actually, with Odessa, we, this was interactive with them. So it wasn't like us going back in a room and then coming back with a big report. Cause you know, I, I, I've been at this for 30 years and I, you know, nobody reads these big reports. So that it was the, the public works department got really excited about this because, you know, they knew their system wasn't inefficient. If they reduced the number of collection days, reduced the number of routes, um, they wouldn't have so much demand for mechanics and drivers, which was a huge headache for them. Um, and also, again, you get to keep recycling, increase recycling, reduce what's going to the landfill, um, and be financially viable. Um, so we, we've had some questions, another question, yes, from John Manier and the PowerPoint, John to everybody but you. Uh, this is from Jamie to everyone. Kathy, I'm interested in your stats if you move forward with that option. Large dumpsters help, but I haven't seen Big Belly used. Um, Jamie, can you help on that? That was in response to um, Kathy's comment that she put out that she's thinking about putting out Big Bellies at their um, drop-off sites and she was going to do a tour. So I was just kind of responding back to her in regards to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this yeah, is, right. how does this analysis look for disposal of trash, especially if a lot more trash will be disposed if there's less or no recycling? And again, Ed, it, you know, when we started this and they were only paying zero to have the recycling processed and 35 to have the trash, 
um, you know, it was really easy to show recycle more and you're going to save money. When that flip flopped and they're paying twice as much for recycling as the trash, you know, it would have been more cost effective for them to throw it away. But again, we, you know, I'll fight tooth and nail to keep recycling going. And so we, like I said, we will show them that, you know, if you reduce this collection and reduce the number of routes that you have, um, that, you know, you, you can have it all. You can have garbage collection, you can have lower rates, and you can save recycling. And that was the other thing that, you know, I, I had mentioned earlier that, you know, even in big cities, I mean, I was doing work in a, a 300,000 population city in California last year, and they did not know what it costs them to run a trash route or a recycling route. And you would think that, you know, everybody would know that, but city budgets are usually set up that you have a line item for salaries, you have a line item for vehicles. So they, a lot of cities have not figured out what's a trash route cost me and what's a recycling route cost me. And so that was one of the first things we did in Odessa was, you know, it was costing them about 115,000 a route. And that includes labor, maintenance, fuel, you know, insurance, the whole, whole bundle um, to run that route. So if you can, you know, save them five routes a week, we're talking millions of dollars. So, um, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of where we start with all of this. Um, Aaron, yeah. um, can everyone hear me? This is award-winning Aaron. So. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, so, uh, GT um, is a in evaluating their program, uh, as um, Jessica mentioned in the, in the comments. And actually last week, I was boots on the ground all week. Um, it was their, their bulk week. So we were following um, the trash and recycling trucks. They're picking up as normal, um, just to keep their routes the same. But everything is going to the landfill since they don't have an active contract with a, a, with a Merck. So uh, I was flipping lids and, and looking in the recycling carts, and it's, it's pretty bad. Um, whether or not that's attributed to people knowing it's going to the landfill or not caring as much about recycling, um, and it was regardless of neighborhood. Um, as you got closer into the city, it did get worse. Um, so we were looking at um, inside yeah, the carts. I do know, so I'm doing work for the city of St. Louis, helping them procure transfer and disposal and recycling and composting services. And the southern part of St. Louis contamination is about 50 to 60%. Um, the northern part is maybe 30 to 40%. Um, and we did some actual landfill modeling or uh, war modeling, and this is a really sad result, but between running the separate trucks for picking up the recyclables and the mere fact that they have a landfill with a landfill gas to energy system, or that that's where the, the trash goes, they are literally better off from a GHG perspective of landfilling it than trying to recycle it. When you're, uh, with, when you have 50 to 60% recycling or trash and you're recycling, you're not accomplishing anything. And that, that, was, that was disheartening to me. Um, I never thought I would say to anybody it's better for greenhouse gas emissions to landfill dispose. But um, I have a question for Aaron. This is yeah. this is Marcy. Aaron, you're looking yeah. at the Cleveland model. Have you looked at making efficiencies on the uh, garbage side, like we we're discussing here today, or is it focused merely on the recycling side? Uh, so it's mainly a recycling study. Uh, we're going to give some some options. Um, we're pretty early in into the project, so. Um, we're still collecting more data from the city on like their average number of um, um, trucks that are out each day and, and compared to bulk because right now um, if they can just get their bulk down, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of residents abusing their program and at this point they're just trying to make sure the streets are clean even if it's kind of out of their, their promised service. So. Um, we're going to look at like what little things they can make efficient because they do have a lot of um, the claw truck uh, automated trucks and and they have two three people on those trucks because of the parking issues uh, they have to move the cart over um, for it to be picked up so you have efficiencies 
even with um, with the staffing um, to get the collection complete when you know usually an automated truck is just the driver and they have helpers to help um, move the carts as well as pick up the extra stuff around the cart, especially during COVID times. Well, first of all, congratulations on your award, well deserved, and they're in good hands. So we are all watching you because this is a learning process for sure. So thank you for sharing that information. <laughs> yes, of course. Thank you, Marcy. Um, when you're evaluating the cost of recycling per ton or trash, how, um, is it reasonable for me to ask? I mean, how? What what costs are those including? Like, is it transportation, landfilling, the people who work it, the whole nine, you know, the whole gamut of everything that's involved? Yes, um, and that's a really good question, Ed, because you really do have to say up to even the point of, you know, the the solid waste director, you know, what percent of his time is spent managing the recycling program versus the bulk program versus the trash program. And yes, we, we look at the, the fuel associated with each, um, you know, the, the vehicle replacement schedule for recycling uh, the number of households served. In general, a curbside recycling program is gonna serve more households than trash because unless you have 100% set out, um, you know, it's, you're, you, you're not stopping at every single household. So yeah, if, if you're really going to do this properly, it, it's, you, you've gotta do all the, the upfront cost allocation. Um, and then, then you have to work with them too. That you know, some costs like the solid waste director. You know, he's his job's not going to go away if recycling goes away. So that's the other thing you have to show. You know, elected officials that just because you get rid of recycling, there are costs that you're still going to have. Um, and we do that a lot. Even I mean, some cities are looking at privatizing, and you know, they have maybe millions of dollars in debt in recycling carts and the the vehicles to pick up the recycling carts. And again, if if you have a customer base who is paying for recycling and you have all this debt and now you have no revenue coming in, now you have to shift all that debt over to your trash bill and your trash bill is gonna go up. So just getting out of recycling or privatizing doesn't mean all your problems get solved. And that's like I said, we, we try to find solutions um, versus just you know short-term decisions that end up with long-term headaches. So Karen, you mentioned 190 cities have stopped doing curbside collection. Did you say since 2019? 2018. 2018. Do you, uh, you mentioned privatization. Do you see anybody privatizing just one service or they privatize uh, trash but keep recycling as a municipal run program? Are you seeing a hybrid of any of that? A little bit in the, I just did a project out in California. And first of all, most of the cities that are getting out of it are in um, the Southwest, uh, Texas, Oklahoma, um, you know, kind of the, the areas that aren't what I'll call the more environmentally oriented communities. Um, but yeah, I, I've worked with some communities that want to keep the trash collection, uh, but get out of recycling. I'm also seeing a trend, in fact, I, I think this was in New Braunfels, Texas, where they're doing commercial collection and they want to get out of commercial collection and just keep residential. And I'm seeing that trend a lot. Because for most municipal programs, if they are competing with the private sector for commercial, usually the municipal sector, and this was in Olathe, Kansas as well, um, that the municipal sector ends up with the smaller accounts, the two cubic yard container, the, you know, the three or four cubic yard container, and the, you know, it's the, the big guys that are going after the, you know, the eight to 10 cubic yard containers, or what I call the bread and butter, which is the roll-off containers, like the, or not roll-off, the, um, yeah, roll-off containers, the 40 cubic yard, 30 cubic yard roll-offs. So a lot of cities are saying, you know, we're servicing these little guys as a money loser. And um, so that I'm seeing a lot of that. And what happens though, is a lot of the commercial recycling is going away with that. Um, Cause again, you know, the big guys are not interested in sending their trucks to pick up a little bit of cardboard from a church. So um, I do see that trend. Makes sense, thank you. Hey Karen, um, I know here in Ohio, um, there's been an impact with waste management kind of leaving the municipal market um, as far as bidding on contracts and stuff. 
Are you seeing that trend um, anywhere else in the country or are they staying in the market in other areas or what, what, what do you see and what the impacts are on that? I mean, it definitely, and John, this is probably not surprising to you. I mean, I'm definitely seeing throughout, especially in the Midwest, you know, the vertical integration that, you know, if, if you got the landfill, then you're going to stay in the collection business. I'm not seeing, you know, much of any company bidding on collection that doesn't have either a transfer station or a landfill in the region where they are. So, yeah, I'm definitely seeing a decrease in bids. And that's a whole other topic of, you know, it used to be, I would see cities put some really strict provisions in RFPs or for collection services. And I think that's got to be more balanced. I'm seeing a lot, you know, revenue share. Most of the cities that I'm helping procure recycling services right now, they are foregoing revenue share and just, um, you know, letting the private sector keep whatever they can make in exchange for a constant processing fee. I mean, cities are not in the commodity markets. You, know, you can't go to your city council and say, I need this budget this year and this budget this year and a higher budget and a lower budget. Well, the revenue share concept, I think, is really going to go away. Yeah, we, we recently bid out the, uh, the commodity um, uh, process here with, um, we, we collect coming of recyclables here. And we actually agreed to play in the market. Um, uh, but... Uh, we got a floor and a ceiling. Right. Um, so during that time period, we know that the most we're going to pay is $35 a ton. The most we're going to receive is $35 a ton on the, on the market side. So um, wow, that, that's then, an amazing ceiling that you got. I, I, I was, I'll be honest with you, Karen. I was shocked. Um, uh, it was, we were very pleased. And that was, that was Rumkey. Um, wow. Because like I said, I, at least from what I read in the paper, I, I heard that it was going to be like $200 a ton for Rumpke to take the city of Cleveland. But, you know, they were, I think they were hauling it pretty far too, down to their mer. But Yeah, yeah I'll, I mean, it's public record. I'll, I'll send you the, uh, the sheets that, uh, that we have. Yeah, um, that's, that's and, sweet. Yeah, it, um, we, we were very, very pleased um, with, with what we got here, so... So we just got our five minute warning. Um, the other trend I'm seeing along the lines of drop off sites, John, is that, um, and again, this was Olathe, Kansas, that they were taking, you know, ones and twos and threes through fives at their drop off sites and their fibers. Most of the contaminants were plastic related. And when they flipped their drop off sites to just fiber, contamination went way down and they got a higher price. Um, and again, I, I'm not saying don't target three through fives, but when, from what I'm seeing, they kind of are the gateway to people getting confused of plastic hangers, plastic toys, plastic flower pots, um, you know, just the, it, it's tricky. So you really have to think about how much you're paying for that little tiny percent higher recovery rate. Right, yeah. Okay, anyone, Kathleen? Oh, I think dual stream for OSS is strong is drop off. So can you explain Kathleen? Yeah, I'm sorry. Your my laptop is in front of my screen. So I couldn't even see what I was typing. Um, <laughs> so um, what we're thinking of is we have uh, this year especially have a very high contamination rate. And um, we are also, you know, this program started in 2012 with Rumpke switched to Republic in 2017. Uh, Republic is threatening a gigantic increase if they go out to bid, right? They're threatening me. So uh, I need to find a way to clean up uh, the drop-off program, rein the cost in. And uh, so one of our thoughts is, you know, having a couple of bins uh, at the site that, that's for mixed recycling and then for paper or fiber. And um, we could service the paper or fiber ourselves because we have a baler at the processing center and we give it to Gateway and we make a, a small pittance amount of money. Um, we don't have the capacity though in the office um, and nobody has a CDL that I'm aware of to actually run an actual trash truck. But that again, thinking big picture, that can always be an option. So, okay. Hey, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we will get the presentation and the PowerPoint to you.
Um, it was great seeing some familiar faces again. So I live in Ohio, but I live elsewhere. I feel like I work elsewhere. So thank you, everyone. Thank you thank very you, much. Karen. Thank you, Karen.